following show contains adult content. It's not our intent to offend anyone, but we want to inform you that if you are a child under the age of 18 or get offended easily, this next show may not be for you. The content, opinions, and subject matter of these shows are solely the choice of your show hosts and their guests, and not those of the Entertainment Network or any affiliated stations. Any comments or inquiries should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for listening. Hey ho, what's up everybody? Welcome to the Jimmy Star <laughs> Show with Ron Russell, bringing the good times in music, fashion, pop culture, and entertainment. We have a great show for you guys today. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. What? I like both of these people a lot that we have coming on, but before we talk about them, let's say hi to my cool, outrageous man about town coast, Mr. Ron Russell hi, and Astro. And Astro, yay. Mm. Look at this Astro. This dog is so dedicated and loves me so much, and I love him so much. If you're wondering what this is, this was made by Hub. What's Hub's last name? Reynolds. Hub Reynolds, I remember. Hub, 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 are you in the chat room? Not yet. He'll probably be in yeah, there. Yeah, when you come in the chat room, babe, are you still making these because they're beautiful? From the computer, you know, you, you do the thing with the mouse and you get that awful pain in your arm. What's it called? Carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah, or carpal something? tunnel know. somebody's ass. Anyway, yeah. you get that and it hurts. So I put this on and believe it or not, it helps my wrist a bit. And I thought it went sharp. With my uh, leopard skin shirt. Absolutely. We love Hub. So here we go. Hub, Hub, Hub. So we got a couple people starting to join us. Um, Don Hinton, how you doing? Don Hinton's in the chat room. B. Claudia is in the chat room uh, from Germany. Uh, I know she's excited about our first guest because she wrote it on, on Instagram. So it should be a lot of fun, you guys. We're going to have John Billingsley on the show today. Who? Um, John Billingsley. Uh, he's a regular on Star Trek, and he was also, for me, uh, I liked him from True Blood a lot because he was in a bunch of episodes, I think 17 episodes of True Blood, which is one of my favorite shows. But he's also been in everything. He's probably one of the more popular character actors in Hollywood. He's been in every show possible that there is to be in, and he's also been a leading man in several shows. And then we have uh, William Perry coming on, like last week's guest, Lee Waddell, actor, stuntman, and lots of really big things. And he's also a stuntman for Star Trek, where the first guy is on, but I think different shows, because there's a lot How do you a lot of Star Trek shows. Stuff? I just do, because these are my, like, this is my kind of thing. Believe it or not, so John Billingsley, um, which, by the way, I ordered his action figure today on eBay, since he's coming on the show. Well, and, he any, uh, I have to ask him if he's any relationship to the Billingsleys. The Billingsley was a big uh, reporter, New York reporter. I forgot his first name. John Billingsley was it, I think. Okay. This guy's name is what? John Billingsley. Oh, maybe it is. He's from. I think he, he's from Pennsylvania. He, this may be the junior of the senior Billingsley. Um, I'm not what sure. What the hell was Billingsley's name? Uh, he was a reporter back in the 50s. I, um, I wasn't born. I don't about, know. <laughs> let me think about Billingsley, Billingsley, Billingsley. Actually, while you're thinking, B. Claudia told me to, to let you know that Nick, her son, is in. Who? Nick is in Venice. Her, uh, B. Claudia's son is in Venice. She said to let you know. Oh, lucky. Lucky, lucky your son. I wish I were in Venice instead of here. And uh, oh, him. Uh, mm -hmm. And also then. Um, uh, oh, Not actually, true. I'm happy I'm here with Jimmy. No, absolutely. So actually, you guys, it shows that John's actually with us. And he told me he had a callback and that he was oh. gonna, he might be late. Our guest told me he had a callback for an acting role and he, it was 12 o'clock. But if he's here, let's bring him on in case he has to leave early. Let's bring him on. Let's bring him on. I'm hey, on. Hey, how are you? I'm well, yeah, my uh, audition got pushed. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I asked them whether I could make it later and they said, actually, we want to push it till next uh uh, until tomorrow. Anyway. Listen, so, yeah. who, who was your father? Uh, well, first off, you're thinking of Sherman Billingsley. Sherman he the, Billingsley. <laughs> and he wasn't a reporter. He ran the Stork Club, the although Stork. he was one of Walter Winchell's great confreres. 
Right. So Roger remember, Winchell, who basically remember, camped out of the Stork Club. I remember Sherman Billingsley now. You're right, the Stork Club. Yeah. And he used to squeal, and this is true, on what used to go on in the Stork Club with celebrities. <laughs> that, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, he had a, He used to tell the, the, the press, yeah. you know, Lana Turner was there getting felt up by John Wayne. You well, know, that's so, why well, Walter Winchell, basically, I mean, that was his office. Well, well Winchell was a, 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 a rat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He was a rat. And then they there's glorified, a lot of, you know, glorified him in that wonderful portrayal they had of him. He was nothing like that at all. Oh, maybe we do an actual intro he'd, now. Wait, he'd sell his mother for a nickel. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's a great uh, there's a great Neil Gabler biography of Walter Winchell that uh, they were all rips, rats. Rips they they were, Luella Parsons was a bitch. Hedda Hopper was no good. They were all rotten people. Uh, in any case, whether I am related or not, it would be distant. Uh, all the Billingsleys, including well, Billings, you know, Billingsley is a beautiful name, and there aren't too many Billingsleys around. Oh, there are more than you'd think. There are, there are a lot more Billingsleys than you'd think. It's just that most of them haven't amounted to much. They still run stills in Arkansas. But how did you still know? run stills in Arkansas? <laughs> how, did you, how did you know about Sherman? Uh, oh, I'm you know fairly well read, and I read a lot of history. Well, people um, have said that to you, I bet, over the years. No, I mean it takes it. You have to be at a certain age. Unfortunately, you know, not that many people really know their history. So, not that many people who are uh, uh, under the age of seventy-five even remember who Sherman Billingsley was. Right. Most, most people. Most people ask me about Barbara Billingsley or Peter Billingsley. Right. Well, Barbara sure. was Beaver Cleaver's mom. Uh, yes. Uh, Peter I, was the kid in the Christmas story. He knows. Uh, he knows everybody. I, I've been to the Stork Club. <laughs> I'm 83. He'll so. be 84 in May. So, uh, so I've been to the Stork Club. It was wonderful. I must tell you that. So hold on. I want to do an actual intro. Yes. I need the intro. All right, everybody. Now we want to welcome to the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell, the incredibly talented John Billingsley. Hello and welcome to the show. We're happy to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be had. We also have uh, <laughs> this is my cool, outrageous man about town co-host Ron Russell. Hey, hey how are you, John. Peachy anyway, Keen. We're best friends already. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I want to say we have a chat room full of people, so please say hi to everybody in the chat room. Uh, they're just starting to join us now, so say hi to the chat room. And then especially say hi to B. Claudia. She's in Germany, and she was freaking out that you were coming on the show when she's Fabulous. a big friend. So she like loves Fabulous. you. Um, Fabulous. Yes, I can, we can just talk about Billingsleys all day long because I know a lot about the Billingsleys. They're all replicates. The room you're in is very interesting. Oh, yeah. He, he, he reads a lot. They're all books. Read, you read a lot. That's what I, I read saying. a lot. Look at all those books. That, that's your office study or this what? Is my, this is my office. It's only one room of a house full of books. I have a very patient wife. Uh, my feeling is you can either become a heroin addict or you can read. I chose reading. Okay, so for me, you can be a heroin addict or you can collect action figures, and my husband is very uh, exactly. okay with that. And he reads, but I, I have read, hundreds. I, I have probably thousands of action figures, of which... I get the action figure of everybody who comes on the show, so I ordered yours off of eBay this morning. Um, now, let me ask you, do you only have people on your show who have action figures? Is that no. just positive? Oh, if you don't have an action figure, you can't be on? We have everybody, but if they do have an action figure, some people like John Berriman's been on, and he's got like 10 action figures. So okay, I yeah. I only got the one action figure, although it does have a detachable head. It's got a spare yes. head, so if you get bored with one head, you can put the other head on. I just I just bought it this morning, so it'll proudly go on my my Instagram later on today. Of which you don't you're not on Instagram, right? I couldn't find you on Instagram. No, I'm not. I'm not. I you know I'm on the I'm on Twitter, which I refuse to call X, and I'm really not even wanting to be on Twitter anymore. The only reason I do social media is to promote the various charitable events and causes that I'm involved with. I'm not much of a uh, e uh, 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 a uh, social media schmoozer. Otherwise, so I I keep my social media. Uh, well, you're intelligent. <laughs> He's not on it. He just does Facebook. Yeah, I mean, you you read a lot. Did you know that people like us are addicted addicted to reading? I do. I do. I We're I read everything. When I used to take the subway years ago, I would read all the advertisements, and I, I mean, it's a it's a disease. I still do it today. I read labels on cans and milk containers. Whatever's in front of me, if there are letters, I have to read it. And it's a compulsive uh, disorder. You know well, that? of all, that's what I mean. If you if you were going to have a compulsive disorder, better it be a love of books, reading and collecting than uh, heroin, love gambling, loose women. No, or you're right about that. Wait, my next question was, are you a Gemini? No, I'm a Taurus. 
Oh, because Gemini's are uh, addictive to reading. I when, actually, does, I, when, does, uh, when does Gemini begin? I was born on May 20th, so I'm on the cusp. Oh, of, you're, uh, you, have, you have a lot of Gemini in you. That's why you're you reading. Gemini's you have He's to know, May 28th, so. Yeah, Gemini's okay. have to know everything. We must learn every day. If we're not learning, we get depressed and miserable. Am I right? We have to know what's over there. I certainly, I certainly need to read every day, and to the extent that one learns when one reads, yes, yeah, I read a lot of, I read a lot of fiction. So a lot of what one. But don't, learns. don't you have to know what's over the hill and behind the door? Uh, I, I, I don't necessarily want to know what's over the hill or behind the door because if it's threatening, I just as soon pretend that the door is not my door. Why don't we talk politics? I mean, in your private life. Oh, I'm very yes, I'm very up on I'm very up on politics. I have to know everything that's going on oh. around me, every single thing. Anyway, all, all right. All so works. anyway, I want to move this no, forward. No, we, we have a lot. Uh, go ahead, go. I, just, uh, I, I wanted people to get to know his personality, actually, not just sell his product. Uh, okay? He doesn't have a product to sell. No, He's, but you're selling. Uh, it. You're I, not giving him a chance to be known to the people. Our show is. You're in Brooklyn. Oh, I see what your show is. I have a sense of what your show is just like that. Oh, yeah. Your show is very unique. I love it. You know, we're in Brooklyn having coffee and Entenmann's cake, and we're talking. You have an That's Entenmann's cake right now? No, but pretend like you are. Pretend. Pretend okay. you're in our living room, and we're, even though uh, we're in Palm Springs. What Entenmann's, what Entenmann's cake are you having? He likes the crumb cake. I, w I <laughs> want you to... I want you to warm up with us, and we warm up together. We do the funny stuff, and then we get to what you know, all about. You know, people really don't give a shit what movies you're in or what book you've written. They really don't care. Well, that's they good because I'm hardly in any know. movies and I haven't they read want, any books. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> they they want to know if you got laid last night. <laughs> that's what they want to know. They want the nitty gritty. Let me, call my, let me call my wife down. That might be a matter for dispute. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to bring you on the show, and I'm a fan of all the stuff that you've done, um, but I actually saw an interview, uh, a thing where you were at a convention and they wanted to throw a pie in your face and what? like you took your shirt off and let them throw a pie in your face. And I thought, oh my God, what a fun guy. Like, like how many people, why, wait, wait, how, let's find out why would, how many famous people would go to a convention, take their shirt off in front of hundreds of people and let somebody up. hit them in the face. Back with it pie. up. Back it up. Now we have to know why they were throwing a pie. Well, you know, you remember the water bucket challenge? Yes. Yeah. So there are all sorts of challenges like that. And there was a challenge, and I can't remember what the cause was. It's will you take a pie in the face for charity? And if you do, then you pass on the challenge to three other people. I'll always do shit like that. I spend a lot of time <laughs> and energy and money kind of raising uh, awareness and raising charity money. for charity. Yeah. I know. I like love it, which we'll I talk would, about I, yours. But in I a would little request bit. a lemon meringue pie. So I. Uh, should so yeah, good. lemon meringue is fine. I mean, uh, it, it wants to be a cream-based pie, not a fruit pie. I think in this instance, it oh, was just a pie cream. plate full of whipped cream. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, though. And the fact that you, like, did it uh, and that you uh, – because I've seen – I watched a bunch of interviews. You know, you're a – you're a generous celebrity who actually like gives interviews, you know, for people. So it's a lot of fun. And that's probably why you have such a big fan base. Cause like I, I so I put the, the I, so I'm, I'm kind of big in social media. I use it mostly for business cause I'm produced movies and I need to sure. get guests to the show. Um, but I put the promo that you and our second guest, who's William Perry, he's like a stunt guy coming hey. on. And uh, I normally get eight to 10,000 likes on a picture and that one has 46,000 likes. So I knew a lot of people were going to watch the show. So they like you a lot. And you know, I think it's Jimmy, a lot of fun. If it weren't for we, the interviewer, the interview show, how would people get to know what people are doing? They would have no idea because there's no such thing as modern magazine, glamour magazine. There's no, no you're absolutely right. There's no such thing as the publicity that was in the 1940s and yeah. 50s. No, you're absolutely right. And, and as, as somebody who is a, a you know vaguely recognizable character actor with limited credibility in the community, I do podcasts after podcast after podcast after podcast you because that's how I'm able to talk about the charity work I do. I, I have no self-aggrandizing message at all because of my career, as far as I'm concerned, I'm 64 years old, is like, you know, eh, I was happy to work. I'm happy to work if there's more work. But frankly, I don't really care that much. What I do care about is raising awareness for some causes that, that matter to me. And that's that's what I always talk about in the end, which I know we'll get to. I mean, Yes, I, we will get to it. I wrote I'm it happy down. to just bullshit till the cows come home. Believe me, friends. I, I am uh, uh, the last of the of the great uh, uh, bullshitters. So you, you asked me. Good. We like bullshit. Jane Russell was a good friend of mine. And we were out one day, and a woman said to her, 
you know, you look just like Jane Russell. And Jane Russell said, oh, I do? She said, yes, but she's dead. And I looked at Jane and Jane said, oh, did she die? And the woman <laughs> said, oh yes, some time ago she died. So, you know, that was my point that I'm bringing out. If I, if I didn't interview Jane, nobody would know that she was still alive. The great Jane Russell who was the most famous woman in the sure, world. Sure, absolutely. And here she is, I thought she was dead. So I have to say uh, two, two applauds, uh, applauds, two claps, can't give the clap. No, two hand smacks for interviewers. I know, we Absolutely. love it. We have a good time with all of it. And so I, my first question that I want to like ask you, and it's a dumb question, because you have all these like really big popular things, True Blood and Star Trek and all this stuff. Um, but I, there's a movie, and I couldn't figure out where you are in this movie, even though your IMDb says you're in it. So maybe you're not in it or you're only in it for a second. But my go-to feel-good movie, believe it or not, is a Cinderella story because I love oh. – I love Hillary Duff. I love uh, the dude, Chad Michael Murray. He's been on our show. and um, So uh, I don't know if I made the final cut or not. I've never seen the movie, but I was a professor who acts like a frog. So there yeah, is a... I think you got cut out of it because I literally watched it again yesterday on purpose okay. while I was working to see if you were in it. And I was yeah. like... The only, the the only reason, I would, think that, you know, the only reason I, I would think that there must be some glimpse of me is because I still get residual checks. And generally, if they cut you out of the movie, you stop getting residual. You don't get residual. Have to, like, watch it. Well, you don't have a big speaking thing in it. That's for sure. No, 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 no. And, and you know, well, I think you, doing? you brought him on to destroy his career. No, I'm not. I just that's no, no, a movie no, I like no, a lot. No, believe me, I, I'm always the first one to kind of like say, let's talk about the worst things I've ever been in because I don't think it's terrible, though. I think it's one of the funnest family feel good movies, you know, of, of the era. Um, it's so much it, fun. I have a, I have a deep uh, you know deep uh, uh, place of, of affection for it because I've getting been getting residuals from it for twenty years and, and anything, that's, anything that sends me a check I love. Well, the stars of that movie, first of all, um, uh, and uh, you are by the way the first person who has ever asked me about a Cinderella story in all yeah. my years of podcasting. Nobody has ever asked me. Well, about Chad a Michael Murray yeah. and Hillary Duff are great stars. They never got in trouble. The lady you like so much plays Hillary Duff's mother. What's her name? Jennifer. Uh, uh, Jennifer, the one you wanted to play your wife in your movie, Jennifer Coolidge. Oh, I love her. Jen Jennifer, Jennifer Coolidge. That's right. I Jennifer forgot Coolidge. Coolidge. Oh, the star of the movie. I love Jennifer. Uh, I, love you know, her. I love her. I love her. She's fabulous. And but it's just a, a fun you movie. You above all people should know if they have to cut a movie for time, they don't, they don't give a shit who they cut out of a movie. They, they all discuss it. Obviously, the frog was not that important of a character. The frog was not that important. I I, I made it faces it like a frog and I danced not, like a frog. Wait, God, it wasn't you they cut out. I didn't it take it personal. The frog they cut out. No, so for me, like, so I, we bring people on all, uh, you know, every week, obviously, we have two celebrity guests. And a lot of times, I always like kind of like the quirky, quirky things. I mean, obviously, True Blood, actually, in the chat room, they're asking, like, How's how's uh, Andrew? What's the Skarsgård guy? Was he cool? Because like everybody thinks he's like the hottest. Even Ron's daughter thinks he's like the hottest Ooh. thing on the planet. He was hot. Uh, uh, Alexander Skarsgård, who was Skarsgård. the uh, introduced I I as, yeah. uh, I I introduced as the villain in True Blood, and then he kind of became the uh, other love interest for Sookie. I didn't really ever work with him. Uh, you know, I I had a relatively small part in that. For those who watched the show in the second season of the seasons that I did, I think I was in five of them. There was a sorceress who turns the entire town uh, into uh, sex fiends. So most of the second season, we're having an orgy. Yes. So I, I had to sign a nudity waiver, which I thought, oh, probably, you know, an episode they'll see me. But little did I know for, you know, 13 episodes, I was going to be running around naked, kind of fucking anything that moved. True. <laughs> And women. I thought it was such a great show. We actually had Nelson Ellis. Uh, oh yeah, he's great. I love Nelson. He's the great. He's a we had a lot of people from it on the show, and um, yeah, some great, great, great people in that show. I, I didn't have, I had, I, I didn't, what, I didn't have that much to do, but what I did was terse, as, uh, as uh, Spencer Tracy said. I know. I, I, I love. You have it. children? Do I have children? I do not. I have cats. No, I have he has cats. We well, have three dogs, but he's got two daughters. And my dog is like my son, so I know what an, a pet is. How, how many years are you married? Uh, 25. Well, 25 together. 23 married. 14 oh, that's good. And how, how did she meet you? Uh, I like to think I met her, but all right. Play it your way. Um, we uh, bumped into each other at various events, auditions, what have you. And then there was one audition in particular that was running ridiculously late. 
So we had two hours in the waiting room together and we had a friend of ours, a mutual friend who kind of served in a weird way as kind of a, uh, uh, a buffer uh, and allowed us to flirt openly without it getting too, too sticky. And uh, at the end of that conversation, I asked her for a number. And in spite of the fact she said she didn't date, she didn't believe in dating anymore, she gave me her, she gave me her number. And then uh, bing, bang, bong. I knew right away. Was it love at first sight? It kind of was. I mean, we'd met before, but it was definitely love at first conversation. The first time we actually had a legitimate long conversation, it was like, ooh. Yeah, I knew right away. I'd been married before. She'd been married before. Uh, but, yeah, but it uh, seems to have been the right marriage. It was the right marriage. 25 definitely. years later. Yeah. You know, in Hollywood, 25 years is a thousand years in the room. Well, not for character actors. There's all, you know, we're, uh, we're an entire different breed. The celebrities and the stars, that's one thing. But we yeah. character actors, I mean, you know, I look like a potato. It's not like I'm going to be screwing around all over the city, no. for God's sake. I'm a character actor, and I'm a three-timer. Well, really? Okay. Yeah, well, one to death. One died, and what happened to the other one? You divorced your wife. Oh, I divorced my wife. And then he was with my his husband. husband died. For, he died of pancreatic <laughs> it cancer. Makes a, it's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> and then me. And we're like on, and a, going on 11 years. So, yeah. yeah no, I, know, I know a lot of young guys, uh, when they start off in the business, they sort of fall in love for the right reasons, not necessarily for love. And then in a few years, when they get a little bit known and make some money, they dump the person they no longer need. So that's what happens among the, the little actors. I think that's just true generally of people, you know. Like Everybody. A lot of people, they get married when they're young, and it's like, you know, you probably shouldn't get married until you're 35. I mean. Yes, I know. agree. So, wait, I want to brag a little for now you. Now you I want to brag a little because you're very humble. Uh, you are a character well, actor, but you're not just a character. I mean, you're a character actor. You've been in everything. Um, and you guys, I didn't write everything down because there's too much stuff to write. But here's some of the stuff that you will have seen John Billingsley in. These are some of the TV shows that he had. Uh, you know, maybe yeah, it was on an episode or two. And don't mumble. And, and these are huge shows, you guys. This is us, Shameless, which we've had oh, everybody from Shameless on the show. The Good Doctor, Criminal Minds, Without a Trace, Leverage. I love that show. The Practice, Silk Stockings, L.A. Doctors, Martial Law, Felicity, The Pretenders, X-Files, Nash Bridges, Diagnosis Murder, Judging Amy, Family Law, Gilmore Girls, which a good friend of ours writes wrote that wrote that Stan Zimmerman, oh, okay. uh, St Gideon's St Crossing, St 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 Touched by an Angel, The West Wing, Six Feet Under, Roswell, NYPD Blue, Stargate, oh, Stan Zimmerman wrote that. Uh, wrote. I said it. Uh, Stargate SG One, Angel, Nip Tuck. I love that show. Cold Case, CSI New York, The Closer. That's not all of them, you guys. I just wrote down the ones that for sure everybody knew a lot. And some of the movies you've seen them in: Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles, oh. High Crimes, White Oleander, Out of Time, The Man from Earth, The Last Word, uh, 2012 with John Cusack, Trade of Innocence, The Watcher, The Shift. Um, and then he's also got. I don't think I mentioned Beverly Hills 90210, True Blood, Suits, Masters of Sex. Scrubs, 24, Dead and Deader, The Nine, Prison Break. And obviously, everybody knows him as Dr. Flox from Star Trek Enterprise because he's on a million episodes, and that's where he has his action figure from. That's where I get my action figure. That's Is that right. where people most recognize you from? Uh, it depends upon the people. You know, some people there. I was in a movie called Out of Time with Denzel Washington. Obviously, Denzel's got a huge fan base. I was his buddy in that movie, so a lot of people recognize me from that. I've been on all the crime shows. The people who are aficionados of crime shows recognize me as serial killers and child molesters. And then there's the sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, I have a little set, specialty, a little subgenre specialty of playing uh, perverts. And then there's the sci-fi community, and they know me from primarily Star Trek, but also all the other sci-fi shows I've been on. There are Stargate fans or X-Files fans. Um, I've been on four or five TV series that flopped. So sometimes you meet somebody who liked the nine or liked intelligence or a show called the others, but the one that survived and lasted for a number of years was definitely Star Trek. And that's where I, most people know me. Do you know, so, Tracy, so Lee you Coco? About, Do you know you? Tracy Lee Coco? I know Tracy. Yeah. Um, she's a friend of ours that we see. Oh, yeah. at a lot. We see her at a lot of events when we go to a different event. Do yeah, like pretty much anybody in the Star Trek community I know. Uh, you know, I've been around in that community for 25 years. The show I was on was called Enterprise, and it premiered in 2001. And uh, you know, we all know each other. We go to conventions. We. I just got back from a Star Trek cruise, uh, which is an interesting thing. Um, so we're all buddies. I know. I think that's. How do you fun. feel about fans that do recognize you? 
Oh, I love the fans. There are two different kinds of actors. There are the actors who shouldn't have been actors because they don't really want to actually meet people. And then there are the actors who, like, every time you walk into a bar, you're looking around to see if you can find the person who's going to buy you a beer that night. I'm that kind. Okay. <laughs> that works. I, I don't mind being recognized as long as I'm not with a, a mouthful of food. Well, I, and even then, I, there's always a part of me that says, you bought me a house. I, I, I mean, I know. If you, hey, hi. You know? No, but I, I, like, I, like the, I like the fan that creeps up on you, and they stand there, and they let you swallow what you're eating <laughs> with knowledge. You. I well, don't like the one that comes and smacks you on the back like you're his best friend and makes you choke on the food. So... <laughs> I make, a, I make a lot. One, I'm not Paul Newman. I mean, I, I think if you had the level of celebrity that the people who are the real mucky mucks have, where you can't leave the house without worrying about being photographed, being stalked, yada, yada. I'm just a, I'm just a kind of vaguely recognizable face. As you say, I've been around for a long time. Right. So people come up and say hi, but it's never to the extent that I begin to feel like, oh, shit, I don't have any privacy. Oh, shit, I can't be left alone. It's only been a pleasure. I really, I, I have nothing negative to say about any interaction I've I, ever I just had. think that there are some people that have to learn that a celebrity is not a commodity of theirs. It's not something that they can attack. I had lunch with Betty Davis and a few producers and directors many years ago at Les Moustaches in West Hollywood. When they recognized her, we were attacked at the table. And Man. they ran Oh, no, all queens. It was a gay restaurant. It was all yeah. queens. All the queens ran over to her. Almost Davis, I love you. I adore you. I love you. And Betty sat there saying, of course you do. Of course you do. Of course you do. Actually, and I thought that was perfectly wonderful, the way she got rid of them, by saying, of course you love me. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as I say, I would be hard-pressed if I were Betty Davis or Paul Newman or anybody else to have that level of celebrity and that level of attention. But I'm so far down on the ladder that it's the perfect amount of attention for me, enough for me to feel grateful and not enough for me to feel overwhelmed. It, it, I've, again, okay. been extremely fortunate in that respect. So let me ask you a question. Uh, have you ever, because um, I know, do you know who Steve Basic is? Mm, I don't think so. He was on one. I don't. He was on one of the Stargate shows, but I don't actually know which one. I just thought maybe everybody. No, you know, I, I was only I was on one episode of Stargate. I had a nice oh, okay. star role, but I I don't know the Stargate world anywhere. You know, if you're a series regular, that's your milieu. If you're a guest star, you're on for an episode or two, and you know you meet some people, but you don't know them. So, so do you have to audition? Because you've been a guest star on like a hundred shows. Like, do you have to like audition to get those also, or do they just pretty much put you in for who you are? Every now and again, you get an offer, but at my level, for the most part, I still have to audition. I tried for a while, in part because I wanted to spend more time devoting myself to charity to kind of say, "Hey, make me offer only." And I learned pretty quick that ain't gonna fly. So I still audition. Mostly at my age, I made a nice amount of dough and I don't really have to work. I love to work, but I don't sweat it. So I turn things down if I'm busy. I don't like horror movies. There are certain things that I'm just not interested in. Well, you did a couple too. You did a few horror movies, I, but you didn't I, really I, like I did, but it's not really my, you know, I mean, I, I, suspense movies, scary movies, I, gory movies. I'm just not that, you know, not my. So we're not going to see you getting your leg chopped off in a no. song movie. <laughs> no, exactly. No, I had an audition the other day about it. Well, I shouldn't talk about it because it's somebody's project and I'm sure it's very dear to them. But it was a, a project that struck me as like, I don't think I want to be attacked by a by a demonic zucchini or whatever. No. The fuck. <laughs> John, John. Are you like me? I, I don't know. Maybe. Hang on, hang on. Great part, big part in the movie. Can't wait to do it. All excited. The night before, laying in bed, tossing and turning. How am I going to play it? Am I doing it this way? Am I, are you one of those? No. No, because, I mean, you know, unless unless some, like, bizarre, well, one, I ain't getting big parts in movies these days, so I don't have to worry about it. But let's say that there is an interesting part. You've had time to work on it, absorb it. There's always nerves that first day you go on a set, but the same way there'd be nerves the first day you go on any job. Not nerves. You don't know anybody. You don't know how you're going to fit in. You know, is a, direct, is a director going to be a dick? Blah, blah, blah. But in terms of my work, to answer your question, in terms of my own process, no, I don't get nervous about what it is. I'm, I'm nervous. Nervous was not the question. Yeah. The question was, 
unsure of how to play it. You yeah. know, you, you, you read a script and you when you first read the script, you got it. Oh, I got it. I got yeah. it. Then you read the script a second time and you say, no, I don't have it. I'm, oh, yeah, now I've got it. And then the day before you're shooting, you lay in bed at night saying, oh, my God, do I have it? Yeah, I no, I don't. I don't tend to. Well, one, I mean, I'm auditioning, so I wouldn't have gotten the job if I wasn't pretty much in the ballpark with what they want. So, you know, for, oh, for the most part, you know that that you're simpatico. I will say that what happens sometimes on the set is that the director throws you a curveball that you feel like, I don't think that's right. And then you've got to figure out whether or not you can find a way to incorporate the note or exactly. whether you have to say something. And that can be tense. It doesn't happen too often. But but again, I'm not I'm not at a level where I'm like being asked to play extraordinary, complicated and well, dimensional. Doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what level you are. Even if you say two words, you're no, it does. It does matter. I disagree with you on that. It does matter. When you two words is two words. You know, when you're playing Lear, you know, Spear Carrier and Lear are two different challenges. I'm not I'm not gonna have a problem. I'm gonna sleep fine if I'm the spear carrier. If I'm playing Lear, I might have a hard time going to sleep. Well, Lear is a little difficult. Now, how, <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about you're ready to do your take and they run over and they say, Here's seven more pages? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Well, you know, David, oh, Milch, what? <laughs> yeah, David Milch famously, I did do a, a how do you feel about that? Hang I on, have a breakdown. Me, you. Yeah, I, it's hard. I, I mean, I that fortunately does not happen very often. I mean. One, again, with the exception of David Milch, God bless him, wonderful writer, wonderful visionary. He was notorious for handing actors pages on the day or massive rewrites the night before. It drove Jimmy Smits off of NYPD Blue because you can't deal with it as an actor. We are not machines. It's not like we can look at the words and absorb them just like that. But most people know that. I mean, again, no knock on David Milch. He's a genius. Most people in the business understand that we are not robots and we have to have time with the words. I don't like it, particularly as I get older, when I don't have enough time with the words. Do you have time? Do you have trouble remembering lines now as you've gotten older, or is this still easy? It gets harder. I mean, it depends upon the script. It depends upon the words. If it's if it's not full of you know esoteric language or scientific right. terms or arbitrary names, the story is the story, and you're learning the story, and it's pretty easy. When it's like, you know, well, I met Ron Grabowski the other day at Moe's Joint, and then we walked over to 42nd Street, and we met Sally Minuti. That's where it's hard. <laughs> you know, that's where it's got, you got to have like these mnemonics that will help you remember these names. Even then, you know. But you have to do what Johnny Depp does and Meryl Streep does. And the other one, Robert uh, uh, De, Niro. De Niro does. And what Ron does, me. <laughs> I slip a little thing in my ear, and he feeds me my lines. <laughs> if he forgets or he gets stuck, I feed him the lines. Because I'm like you. I play a scientist in an upcoming movie called The River, the Red River. Yeah, Red River. Red River. And there are words in there. I said, what the fuck is this? I never yeah. heard of these. I never heard of these. I can't even pronounce he them. He did a movie. We did. A, he did a movie. Uh, it's a... A fun movie, but it was uh, not a great movie, but it was a lot of fun it called Clown Motel 2. And uh, and he had to say the word Bitcoin, and literally he could not remember the word Bitcoin because he didn't know what a Bitcoin was back yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, and he couldn't yeah. couldn't remember it. He mess, kept flubbing it up, and yeah. so we had to, like, write it down so he could read it off of Well, yeah, and then there are all sorts of – you're right, and there are all sorts of little tricks, things, you know, you try and if you can write – why don't you hold a clipboard? It's like, you know, maybe incorporate a clipboard. Yeah. All sorts of little devices. And, the, and you know, on a set, you know, they want the day to move. So, one, they'll come and they'll – let's change those lines. Let's get rid of that word. We're going to give you – we're getting – they don't want you to f fuck up 50 times – because they can't afford to have fall that far behind. Yes. They they help you fix it fast. That that has not been a sometimes, huge problem of mine. Sometimes. So I have a habit of rewriting the lines. <laughs> well, you know, it depends upon the project. Sometimes you can get away with it. And so you, you know, if you're ever if you're on an Aaron Sorkin show, that ain't gonna fly. Right. In case you didn't notice, I have a New York accent. I did notice, yes, yes. And it's a lovely a Brooklyn one. Brooklyn accent. A lovely one. They always hire me to play a Brooklyn gangster. Like I can a see that. And they give me lines and I say, this is not Brooklyn. I'm not going to say, oh, gosh, gee, Huck, I'm going <laughs> to hurt you. Because if you said that in Brooklyn, they'd shoot you. <laughs> You'd be a little faggot. And you cannot do that. They say, well, how would you say it? And I say, 
get over here or else you're going to get it. That's Brooklyn. Yeah, and you know, it's oh. like all things. You feel out the set to the extent that you yeah. have the capacity to say, hey, you say, hey, in those instances where you don't have the capacity to say, but, hey, it's like, you know, hey, you're, I'm, do you, you, hired like, me. you hired me. I'll do my job. Yes. Do, do you dislike, yes. as I do, I just like a director I cannot talk to. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've been lucky there. I would count them on the fingers of one hand. But in those instances where I feel like, you know, I'm not going to get any help from this director and like as not, he's going to get in my way. I just avoid the conversation. And, and you know, most of those people are themselves not that great with actors and they don't want to have a conversation with you any more than you want to have a conversation with them. So it's probably not the big problem. The director, I was in a movie where the director was in another room watching us work on a TV. What the, fuck, like 50 what the yards fuck was away. that all about? <laughs> you know, John, I'm from the olden day movies, you know, where we made movies in the 50s, yeah. where the camera was the size of a Volkswagen, yeah. and we had marks, and we did everything the right way. Now, when you go on a movie, no marks, the camera is up in the world somewhere, yeah. and you don't know what the fuck you're doing, because nobody's telling you what to do. So I well, as you know, I mean, the the, rea the reality of the modern world is that, you know, you have to have about a bajillion cuts in a movie these days for an audience, a young audience to want to watch it. I was watching The Bishop's Wife a few years back, and it's really watch it all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know that great, there's a great shot by the staircase and the camera never moves and every character enters the frame. And it's just it's just a wonder, basically, with with a, it feels like a theater piece. Those days are gone. And, you know, everything about movie making now is so radically different from the way it used to be, including the nature of the way the editor has to, you know, continually keep you engaged as a viewer through rapid cutting. I agree with you. I miss, although I wasn't alive back then, I miss aspects of the old way of storytelling. <laughs> I was very young. <laughs> of course you were. I, believe me, I'm, I'm, six, I'm 64. I ain't no spring chicken. I, uh, well, I my see, first... My first I'll movie, be 60 this year. My first okay. movie, my first movie was 1959 with Tab Hunter and Sophia Loren. So I came, I came into the business with some big people. Yeah. Uh, and the, what set, was the name of the movie. The name of the movie was That Kind of Woman and it was shot in Long Island where I lived and it was directed by uh Sydney uh, Lomet. Lomet, yeah. Oh no shit. Oh, so wow. Did I luck out with that? Well, my brother-in-law was a producer and he got me in. But um, that experience never happened again in my life. Yeah. Never. never. So, that was the ultimate yeah. experience. No, wait, because you do both. So you do a lot of TV and you do a lot of movies. Do you have a preference of one over mm -hmm. the other that you prefer? Well, I'll tell you what, television is more lucrative. I mean, okay. yeah, that's uh, what everybody's been telling me lately. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, we, in, in the industry, long money, as we call it, long money is when you get a series. If you're a guest star and it's a recurring role and you're going to do more than a couple of episodes, particularly if it's a network show, you're going to get a good residual package. Unless you are a lead in a film and it's a really good film, the reality is, is that most movie work, it's independent. Much of it doesn't see the light of day. So I, I think for me, I would say just pragmatically, my career is pretty much rooted in TV and I'm happy to do film, but it's not where, you know, I, it's not where I made my bones. I, I, I worked with an actor years ago, a really great actor whose name was escaping me. And he, he had a lot of lean years because he intentionally said, I don't want to get typecast or ghettoized as a TV actor. I want to be a mainstream motion picture actor. So I'm turning down anything that is going to give me a TV resume. And he spent a long time kind of being poor, but it paid off for him. He became a very well-known film actor. It's a choice on a certain level that you may have to make in the industry, whether or not you want to kind of have a quicker payoff and do TV now or hold off and hope you can get a film career later. I'm actually, so I, I produce a lot of movies and I've been recently asked to produce some TV stuff, but I've never done it before. But everybody's telling me like if I move, you know, more into TV, I can make a lot more money than I'm doing as a yeah, but, as a film producer. So I'm probably going yeah, to venture gonna, to guess into that. You're a not going to have the leisure life that you live now. Television is a bitch. I've done the, the, the one thing I will say is it's streaming has radically changed the model. Yes. You know, I mean, a back lot. in the day, as you know, you know, TV show, hour long drama, 32 episodes, and it went to 26 episodes, and it went to 22 episodes. A streaming series may shoot 10 episodes. 
It yeah. may only take you four to five months out of the year. The, the problem is it doesn't pay you much on the back end because the streaming doesn't pay residuals. And they have you under contract in a way that really kind of bones you because they're not allowing you to do other things, but they're only employing you for five months out of the year. So there's, there's, there are a lot of reasons we struck, and they have to do with the way that streaming model does not function very well. For something's going to have to come. Something's going to have to happen with that soon, though. But as you know, tricky. In film, we can have a little fun. We can loosen up a little bit. Film yeah, is you're, hard. Tell yeah, you're shooting three days and shooting three pages instead of nine pages a day. Television, you're not going to like. On time, no strict law. Read this, sign that. It's, an, it's amazing to do a little set. When I did whatever that show, what, McMillan and Wife, I think it was, one of them, the paperwork, the, 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 the this and the that. And the, yeah, but that was oh, my God. I said, what the fuck is this all about? Like, th there they want a robot. When I go on a movie set, I meet everybody. Because, I mean, the star, of course. Oh, how do you feel about this, John? You're in the movie, and the star does the scene and then goes in his dressing room and won't talk to you. Yeah, I, I've had that happen a little bit. Um, an actor who I will not name, although this was a television show, never did his turnarounds and would r arrive late. He would have you his... Can name it. You can name it. No, he doesn't want to name it. No, I don't, I, don't, I, don't ever want to, I don't ever want to kind of like, you know, point at anybody in particular. You never know. There's somebody who's just said, you know, I don't know. Probably, no. was, it probably was, what's his name? The one that everybody says. Anyway, and, I finished his story. Yeah. <laughs> So, but, you know, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's really, I mean, it is, it would never, ever occur to me that, you know, that you should basically uh, let down a fellow actor. You're there to give that person, as they are to give you, the best whack at the best. Absolutely. You're in that scene for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, uh, that, that is, that is just hard to walk by. I, I've only, I've only had that happen once or twice. And it's always been in, in television, never in film. The one I'm talking about that everybody says does it. He's terrible. And we like him a lot. He's in that wonderful show, that cowboy show. Kevin Cosner. No. Kevin Cosner wouldn't talk to you if you dropped that on the set. Oh. Well, I mean, I definitely have had experiences where you kind of feel like the number one on TV or the the lead in a movie is no. not to be approached. And and I, I yes, as a as a human being, my feeling is always like, hey, you know, if you're number one, one of the jobs is to create the tone and environment on the set where everybody can feel comfortable and relaxed. If you're not doing that, you're making it harder for other people to feel comfortable at work. And how is that a good thing? It's it's done nowadays. But having said that, having let me just finish this point. Having said that. I have to project myself, like you mentioned Betty Davis. When you're a big star and everybody wants a piece of you, I think you learn how to kind of elbow out the space you need to do your work. And it's also your number one, and you've got a really bitchy job. It's hard. It's yeah, but I was crazy. talking about relationship between fellow actors. Joan Crawford knew every cameraman, every lighting man on the set. She would play cards with them. Betty Davis superstar loved her crew yeah. james russell loved her crew she and robert mitchum when they were making macau they they put a blanket on the floor and they all got drunk so with the crew and i and i i think that makes it that's the way to do it i totally that, agree but that was the the, uh, the the good manners of the stars these little shit asses today think who the fuck they are like jennifer lopez a good friend of ours is a dancer and she was in a movie with Jennifer Lopez. Music video. A vi a, what was it? Music video. A music video. And they told her, do not look at Miss Lopez. Do not speak to Miss Lopez. And this girl said, I'm a fucking dancer. I'm one of her chorus girls. We don't I mean, this is my This is my general, my general approach is that I, I always feel like until I have a personal experience with somebody... I try not to let. No, them. this friend of ours is a very important lady. No, 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 no. I, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm just saying, you know, yeah. because because no, the thing I agree is, with what you say though, because I no, have a lot no. of people. There's a lot of people that everybody always comes to me and says, "Hey, this person wasn't nice to them," and we have them on our show, and they're nice as shit. Well, that's exactly yeah. the thing. Is you well, just no, you just no don't do know that. what the deal is with somebody when they have a shitty day, and maybe they're a shitty person and they change. I always kind of feel like you know what I've got is a person in front of me now, and I'm going to work with them or relate to them based on what they're giving me now. Actually, 
I had a bad experience with somebody in the movie 2012. I won't say who it was, but I met him at an event and uh, uh, in public where I was Elton John's guest to a concert, and he was there, and he was not nice at all. But yeah, I let him have it. But anyway, here's what I want to do. I want to go. I want to play a real quick clip. It's only a minute. All right. Long. A view on Star Trek. All and right. One reason why I'm bringing it up is because it's with um, Robert Picardo, and uh, we actually are doing a movie with Robert Picardo. Uh, yeah, so now, so this would then this wouldn't be from Star Trek. This would be from the Orville. Oh, from the Orville. Yes, from the Orville. Yes. yes. I, yep. I love and, uh, the guy. He's so he's such a great guy. Nothing we're doing like a movie his, with him uh, right yeah. after the Academy Awards. I think he we're going to so be going nice. into pre-production. So I want to play this just because it's a uh, you. But, now we know you and him, which we're getting ready to work with. You um, know why I like him so much? He's another Italian from no, Brooklyn. You don't know Robert Picardo. You Robert haven't met Lissato, him yet. No, talking. Picardo. Oh, I, thought was, <laughs> I thought you were talking about no, Robert Lissato. No, no, Robert Picardo. We're doing. Is, Do you know is, Robert Lissato? I know Robert Picardo. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Lozano is a very super big famous horror uh, guy. No, he's not horror. Lo Robert Lozano. Now he is, but back in his career, he wasn't. He, he was the, he was in the Mule with Clint Eastwood. He's in. He yeah, was in he, Nip Tuck like you. He is such a. Guy he's now. a nice guy. Uh, anyway, here's he, the clip. We're going to play this nice. clip, you guys, from the Orville. Uh, Juan, go ahead and play the clip. We want to show it to everybody, and this is you. And uh, let's enjoy it. It's only a minute long. We'll be right, right. back. Author of a paper first published in the Salean Journal of Science, the Malara vaccine, and its effects on the risk of Torrens syndrome, a formal dispute. Ah, it all comes back to him. It wasn't personal. He needed more peer review. He was wrong. Oh, no, 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 you were wrong. And you are going to admit that you were wrong. To rush publication of his research. You are without... going to renounce your position. Thousands of people would have died without that vaccine. You are going to tell the world that you lied. He was right, you were wrong, and you can't live with the guilt anymore. This is insane. I will not go on record declaring a vaccine is dangerous when it isn't. All right. All right. I well, Dude, I have to tell you something. So <laughs> as soon as it comes on, I said, that's Robert Picardo. And then you came on the screen. He goes, he looks for it. I'm like, that's the guy we got on the show right now. <laughs> and he starts laughing. Jesus. I'm telling you, 83, it's, it really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but I like well, love you look it. so different without the glasses. Well, and you got a rubber head on, you know? I mean, uh, that's that's the thing. You're, when you're wearing a rubber head, it's like I barely recognize myself. Oh, I don't know him, but the other one looks familiar. <laughs> I like love it. Um, okay. So um, so uh, I want to um, – I want to like go make sure we have we got about we have we have we still have some time left, but I want to make sure we get in your charity work. I know that you do a charity. It's called uh, Trek Talks. You can go to Trek Talks T R E K like Star Trek. You guys TrekTalks.net. It's a fundraiser that you host. Uh, I think I went on the website. I think that's it's been three times you've done it. Yeah. So the charity itself is the Hollywood Food Coalition, which is based in Los Angeles. Although I think as a model for what other cities and um, communities can do. It's a good one. We basically provide a hot meal to all comers seven nights a week. We rescue three million pounds of food a year and we share it with about 150 other community groups. We augment and buttress their meal programs. And then we sit down with a lot of other food rescue organizations to figure out ways that we can collectively rescue, share more food, figure out how to get more refrigeration capacity, storage capacity, find more beneficiary groups find more organizations that need food so uh, i do a lot i've been working with them for about eight years we've grown the organization quite a bit and trek talks is a annual telethon eight hours long we have like jerry lewis telethon we have a ton of star trek guests so we interview they entertain us they I don't know, stories and skits and I don't know, blah, 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 blah. so uh hollywood food coalition is hofoco.org if you're interested in that trek talks you can find pre-existing the last three trek talks shows we did on youtube and then real quick i also do something else i uh, my mother passed away from pancreatic cancer oh, so, so yeah well yeah so there's she a one husband oh it's the third it's the third um unfortunately most lethal cancer uh and the fastest growing cancer in, in uh and i interrupt you yeah I I went to a million doctors from L.A. to New York to Florida with Sal, and every doctor said due to cigarette smoking. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, 
God knows there are a lot of reasons. My uh, my mom passed away at seventy. She was a cigarette smoker in her youth. I think that definitely is is uh, you know. I mean, there's no, no world in which cigarette smoking is good for you. Yes. But, but the organization is called uh, Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. On April set twenty seventh, there's a walk called Purple Stride. It takes place in sixty cities all over the country. I am part of a team that raises money called Trek Against Pancreatic Cancer. If you go to Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and you go to Purple Stride, we are right now the team leaders. We've raised more money. You can support the Purple Stride Walk and our efforts to fight back against pancreatic cancer. I love the fact that you use your celebrity for good things. I mean, and a lot of celebrities do, but I just think it's very uh, it's really to, cool to we, do that. We have to really conquer this disgusting pancreatic cancer. Well, this is good. Here's I want to throw out some good news, which is... yeah. No one on this planet has ever survived from pan pancreatic cancer. Ah, but you're not wrong, because Kitty Swink, who is a Star Trek alumni, is a 20-year survivor. Wow. And it's really oh, the, I've had it on the tip. If you the message, to, wait, no, the message is, if you catch it early enough, one, so early detection is really important. A lot of people have symptoms that they don't realize could possibly be connected to pancreatic cancer. Back aches and stomach aches. They think, ah, screw it. I'm not going to go see a doctor. The, survive, the survival rate, my, when my mother died in 1990, 2% survival rate is up to 13%, which may not sound like a lot, but that's tens of thousands of people who are now living at least five years longer. And they are coming up with some really amazing, I mean, the medical research that is being done, which is one of the things this organization helps to support. It's really mind blowing. I mean, I'm not a scientist, so it's hard for me to talk about it, but there is some really cool cutting edge research. It is not a death sentence. I love it. I think it's terrific. Well, I hope not because- It's terrible uh, disease. It, 20 years ago, Sal came down with it. And he died in thir three months. Yeah, that's what happened to my mom. They, they from my from. But, too, three months. but also, some of what's happening right now, is in in large part because I think this organization, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, is doing a lot to raise awareness, is that doctors are realizing, oh, you know what? I just have automatically always thought nothing I could do. In fact, there may be more that I can do. There are more people actually beginning to really specialize in pancreatic cancer treatment. More doctors are beginning to put more time and energy into thinking about what might work than ever have before. Um, I think it's super cool. So, so let's go. Just tell us both of them again. One of them is yeah. Hollywood Food So Coalition. the easy, easy thing is Hollywood Food Coalition, which is hofoco.org. And the other one is Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Those are the two organizations. I mean, I do a lot of charity work helping to support other things, but those are the two kind of, you know, uh, two guns I really fire. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah. Where do you get the food from? All over the place. Grocery stores, farm-to-table programs. There's a wonderful organization called Imperfect Fruit. Basically, it's all the fruit and vegetables <laughs> that are not considered to be pretty enough for the grocery stores. Does the government supply you with any free food? Some, but not really. I mean, there are Feeding America, which is probably the most well-known organization. That, for that a lot. Yeah, there are 200 Feeding Americas all over America, and that's where a lot of the food rescue that we know of happens. And they're great, and they're amazing, but they deal in huge quantities. The expectation is if you're getting drop-offs from Feeding America, you're getting pallets. What we try and do is recognize small neighborhood groups that may be like a battered women's shelter or a group that works with street kids that need to find good food for 20 or 30 people. Feeding America isn't really designed for them. We're trying to fill that niche. In a way, what we're kind of trying to do is say through food, we're helping to rebuild on a real basic community level, a tattered social safety net. It's the medium through which all social service organizations have to function. If somebody's in a drug and alcohol rehabilitation program, they got to be fed three good squares a day or they ain't getting the program. Very good. I, I don't know if they still do this or if they did it ever, but in New York, all the restaurants got together and instead of throwing out food, yeah. they gave it to the homeless. I and it's, it's a really good example of where some of the problem is, is that to make that happen, Restaurants that close at night, you have to have somebody that can come pick that food up late at night. 
So you need a network, a network of food rescuers. It needs to go somewhere. You're not going to be able to bring it to a beneficiary organization right away. So you're going to have to find a place to store it. Where's the refrigeration? Who's going to pick it up? Who's going to deliver it the next day? Et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the work is bringing groups together to collaborate to make it possible to rescue the food that's out there. 40% of the food in America gets tossed before, you know. Yeah. And it also it goes to landfills, which which is methane. So it's also an ecological challenge. Um, if we could stop food waste from going into landfills, it would be a big, big uh, bump right. up. Instead of letting the poor homeless go to the fields where the garbage is thrown and pick out food. Yeah, you know, and, I and one, in, one in five American kids is food insecure, meaning that when they wake up in the morning, they may not be hungry, but they're going to worry about where's the next meal coming from? What's it going to be? Is it going to be any good? Terrible. Will there be enough? It's the richest country in the history of the world. So, yeah. Terrible. Uh, okay. I want to say one, la one last thing while we're on this subject, because the other oh. thing that's really important to me is we also do a podcast called Trektivism, and a lot of my work is about encouraging people who are fans to bring forward the cool things they do in their communities. Because I really believe that a lot of the problem we've got right now in our politics is that we only view each other as like villains, you know. Most people are trying to do cool things. Most people are trying to do nice things in their community. And we need to tell those stories and to get people excited about figuring out what is my volunteeristic bliss? How can I get more involved, me personally, on the ground in my city or town, starting to do things that make people feel better? Uh, that's a lot of what animates me. I love why. So, how do people listen to that podcast? It's called Attractivism. So you can just go online and find it. Trektivism. T. It's like activism in Star Trek. Trektivism. Okay, I love it. I know how difficult it is. Uh, I was the creator and the founder of Have a Heart. Yeah. Have a Heart is we a bunch of drag queens. We put shows on all over the country, and we raised money. Elizabeth Taylor found us, and she said, "Unite with me, and have a heart." we joined with the Elizabeth Taylor Foundation for AIDS Research. And between, I gave it up because now I couldn't work. I, it was, I couldn't handle it anymore. It just yeah. got bigger than I ever thought it would be. It started off with me and three other drag queens. And then it went into, I don't know what it went, it you know, exploded. But the amount of time and work that you have to put into a, a, a benefit, oh my God, it's, it, you, don't, you don't have those hours and minutes. So who, who works with you? Uh, well, for Trek Talks, we put together a team of about 15 co-producers. Uh, the Hollywood Food Coalition, uh, we have a staff of 27 and a full-time executive director. Pan no, can. You have an assistant. You. Uh, do I? No. No, no. I mean, but that, this, the thing is that I'm in a lucky place in my life, you know? I mean, I, I had a nice career. I'm happy to work, but I don't need the money, and I don't necessarily want to work all the time. So I, I kind of have turned this into my, you know, my my Job. later years effort. Yeah. I love it. Okay, so uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, I want to um, – this is something I like to ask all the actors who come on the show, uh, and, and the people who listen I always want to know what the answer is. So bucket list – Male and female actor, you could work with anybody living or dead. That you well, you got to say Meryl, right? I mean, everybody wants to work oh, with Meryl. No, you don't have to. <laughs> okay, hold on. Male and female. And then the second part of the question is, any uh, if you could have ever been in any movie uh, or for you TV show, since you, like, since you do a lot of television, any movie or TV show ever in history, what movie or TV show would you have liked to have been in? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful time. life. Oh, that's a good one. That we get a lot. We get a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, I you know I think that is still to me the most profoundly moving movie I've ever seen because I think it so touches on what it is that that animates all of us—the knowledge that the way we live our life, we can't see how it affects other people, but if we're living purely and we're living well, we know we're making a difference in the world, and we have to hold on to that. I like love it. So, uh, okay. and Jimmy Stewart would be the other person dead. I, I would just love to, I just like to be around him and just hear him go, oh, 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 oh John, John. I mean, <laughs> how could you not want to be with that guy for a while? You know, I'm actually named in actu after In him. actuality, in, in real life, he didn't speak that way. Oh, really? No, well, I'd like, to, I'd like to see, I'd like mother, to see that too. No, my mother was not, she was. She, oh, no, Miracle on 31st Street. My mother was in Miracle on 31st Street. Oh, really? But Jimmy Stewart, I was at, uh, Bistro Gardens, 
and Jimmy in, the, in Beverly Hills, yeah, 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 a wonderful restaurant. And Jimmy Stewart and his wife came in, Gloria. Gloria, yeah. They sat a table over there. Of course, I didn't approach him, but I was eavesdropping, and he spoke. I was waiting for that. <laughs> he didn't do any of that, so I think that was a put on, like Cary Grant. Cary Grant, yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. No, yeah. when they established something that clicked, they kept it. Yeah. They oh, didn't man. waste it. Yeah. Uh, who else was it that I was disappointed in? Another big actor, who, who was it? James Cagney. Nothing, nothing like his film persona. Quite well spoken, enunciated, mm -hmm. and was quite the gentleman. Oh, I'm interesting. Totally, so I, I'm fascinated by oh, Betty Davis, the ultimate in real life, cursed, smoked, could could inhale a cigarette and down scotch at the same she time. She turned a hose. She turned a hose on me when I was a child, Betty Davis. I, I cut across her lawn in Westport, Connecticut, and she, get off my lawn, and turned the hose on me. <laughs> well, that, that, that's who she was. That's fun. She, was, she never wore makeup. She was the furthest thing from what you, that elegant woman you saw on screen. Yeah. She was a, she I, I didn't know who she was. I was a kid. was like, who's that old bat that just turned the hose on me? <laughs> well, Donna Stay did that to my daughter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? We, we lived in Beverly Hills, and, uh, the, the children picked flowers off her front lawn. I like love it. So and you guys, caught, she caught them and sprayed them. So you guys, please support uh, Alan, John Bailey. Alan, Alan Ladd's grandchild. Oh, we watch a lot of Alan. Uh, and and my daughter we, played together. Alan, what was his name? The kid, Ladd. One of Cheryl Ladd's kid. Yeah. Daughter, Cheryl, daughter or son. Anyway, whatever it was. So I said to her, "That was my daughter and Cheryl Ladd's child," and she would. <laughs> Anyway, I got another guest, so I'll let you. I'll let you. Say I, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, I really am. I really enjoy your work. Thanks for coming on, um, and thanks for all the, the great work that you're actually doing for the world uh, to help to help yes, your communities. It's, it's very, it's very, very honorable, doing. and I really like and it a lot. You know what? For all the energy that you put into this, believe me when I tell you, you get back what you give. I believe you. I think that is very true. I'm, so if you do good. You're gonna get back good. And if anything big's coming up uh, that you got, and any you're gonna shows, win an let Oscar. Me know. Let me know, and we'll bring you back on any time. And and actually, I'm gonna put you on my because I'm producing nine films right now. If and we have anything really juicy that might be good, I'll I'll give you a little message and, and see you're gonna, if you might be interested. You're gonna win an Oscar, and <laughs> I'm gonna be in your movie, and you're gonna be the star, <laughs> and you're gonna go in your dressing room and ignore me, and I'm gonna beat the <laughs> fucking shit out of you. Wow. Wow, that's we get. We better get on that. Given our ages, we better push. That's going to have to happen pretty fucking fast. Is all I have to <laughs> John, thank you so much. John, you're Enjoy terrific. yourself. Thank you so much. I would much. like to work with you. Absolutely. Think it would be fun. All right. Bye bye. You never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. Take bye, guys. Care, bye bye. Bye bye. All right, everybody. So that was John Billingsley. Wow, well, fun. Nice gonna, guy. Good guy. We're going to take a quick uh, music break and play Stefano. Why I'm here, and then we'll be back with our second guest, William Perry. Oh. Take it away, Juan. Reflection in the mirror. Try to be strong, but nothing's clear. It's been a long day. Yes, yeah, it's been a long year. Ma keeps calling, saying, listen here. Kick them doors open, your kingdom will come. Don't lose hope, son, stay full of love. So I drown my fears and I swim to change. Now watch me run through the pouring rain. This is why I'm here. This is what I'm here for. Stop doing things I don't want to do Guess it's cool Cause it brought me to you on this windy road Yeah, friends come and go But I got you here now And you're all I know You wake me up You hold me down You never leave you On my crown There's no question 
question, it's crystal clear. Yay, everybody. All right. Now we're back. Oh, and look, at it's already here. Here I am. What a lovely song that was. Oh, my gosh. You guys got to make me cry with your intro music. Kill so me. that that uh, that is actually a good friend of ours, Stefano, and he was on American Idol Season 7, uh, I think. And actually, we have the winner of Season 17 coming on in like two weeks. But let me do an intro well, for you. you say so. Go crazy. What he just sang, I don't care for that song. I have been in his company where the piano was playing and he was singing and he was brilliant. He's a brilliant singer. I and, love that you know, song. He, I don't we disagree. Like, I love I that song. I don't like all the mechanics in the song. I don't like the screaming. I don't like the woo. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's I think not, it's, if you hear he Simon, doesn't like Mariah Carey or Christine Aguilera or any of those no, people either. Well, the they all that. It's the sentiment of this song that got me. This is yes, what I'm here for. I love it. Yeah, that's not All right, hang on, everybody. Now we want yeah, to welcome. Who the hell am I anyway? Now we want to welcome to the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell, actor, stuntman, author William R. Perry. Hello and welcome to the show. Hey. Yay! Good to be here. <laughs> and it's so funny because uh, first of all, this is my cool, outrageous man about post, Ron Russell. Hi, hello. We already know each other. Yes, we're roommates, and we have a few people in the chat room. Give a shout out to the chat room. Shout out in the chat room. There you go. Hey, Look at you. He's got a mic and everything. You must do this a lot. Uh, I do some, uh, I do audio books. And so I got some decent mics. Oh, there you, you go. You do an audio book? Yeah, I've got, uh, well, I've, you, I've done a couple know? of my own, but I also have done about 30 others for other people. Do you know a, a friend of mine? The queen of audio book, Barbara Rosenblatt. I know the name, but uh, not, uh, I mean, I, I, the only person I know in this is the guy that taught me how to do it. He's got more <laughs> awards than anyone she did Barbara Streisand's uh, life storybook. She, Barbara Rosenblatt, is probably she. She she does the whole book, all the characters with different voices. Do you do that too? Do you? Or do you just? Yeah, do I, I, I did a, a seven book series. Uh, he called it a space opera, and there was thirty five characters in thirty five hours, and uh, different voices and different genders and different. And it's it's actually a really uh, fun thing to do as a, as an actor because it's like one the longest cold read you ever had in your whole life, you know. Because uh, I don't read them first; I got it takes too long. Well, I so went. I was, to, I was meeting her for lunch in New York, and I went to the studio, and she's in this little glass booth, <laughs> eyes of one by one, and suddenly I hear this man. Oh no! Don't do that. Why not? I want. I thought, holy shit. It's tricky because because uh, you have to be able to distinguish. I love it. You got to know who's talking. It's not even just the voice, yeah. but because the book doesn't always say said Bill, right. you know, it just you change. You know, it changes. You uh, remember which voice you do. If you do thirty five voices, you got to remember which voice you did for which they character. A, they have a I keep a I keep a picture on the wall of the people they remind me of, 
that way I'll go, well, he kind of reminds me of James Doohan from uh, Star Trek. So and I don't do a James Doohan impression. It's just, it helps me. To click into who it is. So if, if it sounds like James Doohan, it's lucky, but not. So if I was, you know, I think audio books are the greatest thing since Carvel ice cream. Uh, <laughs> Does that still exist? Yes. I think they okay. still I don't know. Uh, uh, because you can be driving and listening. Uh, you can be cleaning a house and it, they're wonderful. I don't Give think. Us, I, wait, hang on, hang on. Give us some titles that we could know you from. Uh, well, <laughs> just because you mentioned it, um, <laughs> I have. My, <laughs> you just have to have I'm a total sellout. I'm sorry. Um, I have a book called uh, "By His Hand" uh, that I what did. Is first, uh, By, his, By hand. his hand. And then the sequel is called Out of His Mind. And they're two short novels. Uh, but I've done a, a bunch of novels for a place called Red Cape Publishing in uh, the UK. And it's called The A to Z of Horror. And so it's 13 stories by 13 different authors from all over the world. And they're amazing. Such good stuff. But you know, you'll do a book on uh, exorcisms. So we got 13 stories about exorcism. So how many exorcism voices do you got? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like you start talking like this for a while. And you're like, no, that's not going to work. I already did that. Uh, one of my favorites was the guy said, "You always think your demonic voice is going to sound like The Exorcist, but it just sounded like me." I'm like, oh, thank <sighs> you. That's going to save my throat for the next hours. I don't have to do some screechy, scratchy, you know, demonic thing. Actually, let's talk about the, your your. Uh, first of all, to go back to Carvel, I don't know if they actually have Carvel like Dairy Queens anymore, like they used to. But if you go to the grocery store, you can buy Carvel like yeah. ice cream cakes and stuff. No, of which they used that to guy that did the commercials. He talked like this is Fudgy the Whale. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the commercials from way back? I love it. When I lived in New York, we had a Carvel stand, and yeah. it was fifteen cents for a big Carvel ice cream. 15 cents. Could you, Do they uh, have an ice block in that? I'm just curious because it sounds like it's a while back. Yeah. They have ice back then? <laughs> yes. In my, it would, it was was still warm back ago. then. This is back, I think it opened in 1955. The oh, so the dinosaurs were pretty much long gone. Okay. Back. I, <laughs> no, actually, actually. Did you hear what he said? He said dinosaurs were long gone by then. <laughs> no, I think it, it opened earlier than that. I think I was about 10. So it opened in 1950 because I'm 83. So I, I go back a long way. I, I love him good for 83. I'll give you that. Uh -huh. oh, and he still works all the time. No, I wanted <laughs> to say something to you now. Oh, yes. The reason that I love audio books so much is because I'm from the day of the radio. And the radio in a sanctum, open the door to <laughs> in a sanctum. And we get scared stiff. And audio books do the same thing. If you put one on and you're in the dark in your bed, and you have a spooky, uh, it's far greater than a movie because your imagination yeah. is doing it, right? Sure. So I I, a, I suggest people, you get his audio books. There's a great uh, uh, app called Chilling. Uh, it's called the Chilling app. And it's nothing, but it's like Spotify, but it's all just scary stories and scary short films. If you're into scary, it's awesome. Uh, I've got both of my books are on there, but it's thousands of hours of stuff. So anybody that's really into spooky and just wants to listen to it, like sort of old time radio, chilling up rocks. I don't get anything for saying that. They're just really cool people. And so it's a great before, before we let's just go back to your books real quick. One of them came out in 2023 called by his hand. The other one just came out recently and you had a signing this weekend at dark delicacies. How'd it go? It was awesome. Uh, you know, I haven't done one of those before. I didn't get into, I, I never had a dream of being a writer, but I, I had this terrible nightmare about two years ago and I wrote it down just because it was so freaking scary. And I sent it to my publisher as a little synopsis. And he says, Jesus, that's scary. And I said, well, you read a lot of scary stuff. That's kind of a compliment. And he says, do you want to write it? And I said, oh, I'm no writer. And he said, well, I'll do it. And so about a month later, I checked in with him and he said, I haven't started. I said, you know, I'm going to take a swing. And I wrote it and I just expected that I would get dozens of pages of horrible notes. I'd be massively discouraged and I'd never pick up my uh, pen again. And he said, no, it's really good. I'm going to change three commas. Shit, let's go to, let's, you want to launch next month? I'm like, you can do that in a month? And he said, yeah. I'm like, are you really going to do this? And he said, do you want to? I said, well, of course I do. Uh, but I just didn't expect that. And so uh, the second book it occurs exactly one year after the first and it launched exactly one year after the first. And it's a continuation of the story. And any any good story is a hundred times more 
like a great sequel to a great movie is more intense. It's bigger, it's badder, it's scarier, it's whatever. And so uh, that's kind of what I attempted to do with it. And it's getting really good, you know, good reviews. I'm getting, uh, so, so did you do the audio book already for the second? Yeah. One? Yeah. You, I did the audio book uh, for yeah. both of them. Yeah. I mean, I've got the gear and who's going to know the story better than me. And the only thing that happened, these stories are, these stories are very, very sad in a way. And so I found that the first time I read it, um, I got so choked up the way I did when I wrote it that it didn't, it was like, no, this is over. This is too much. So I did it again. I was like, no, that's too easy. That sounds too bland. Then I had to do it again <laughs> to try to get just that mixture of, of, you know, intensity, but I still have to be the reader. You know, I still have to sort of set myself aside just a little bit and let the other people talk. You know what I mean? Yes. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I think it's, sort of a better book than it is a better audio book than it is a book because oh, cool. you know you were saying you get the pictures in your mind but mm -hmm. i think that voice that really brings it to That's life you know gives you a little extra you now, know? you got to turn them into movies my friend barbara rosenblatt who is the queen of audiobook said to me ron Thank God for audiobooks because that's my future. Otherwise, I would starve to death. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Do you feel the same? No, yeah. I mean, I've done about 30 uh, plus books now. So you're and making it's, a lot of money. Yeah, it's not huge, but it's something it's I really enjoy job. doing it. I could just, I can do it at two in the morning, you know, whatever makes sense to me. And uh, when I'm done, I listen to them and I think, yeah, I'd listen to that. That's a good book, you know. So it's, so it's a lot of fun. And it's, uh, I'm actually writing a screenplay for this one. I've had a couple different people ask me in a graphic novel probably to come as well. Um, and it's very different to write screenplay versus book, as you guys would know. Uh, you know, in a book, you can say he thought, but, you know, if it didn't, if you don't see it, didn't hear it, didn't say it in a screenplay, I mean, nobody knows it happened for the right. most part. So uh, it's been a really fun uh, uh, writing challenge. And I think. I actually think the screenplay is better just because I can tell it in a different way. I can take things out of order and I can spook you and I can throw you off on a red herring and play around <laughs> with your brain a little bit and, you know, shock you and disturb you. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to, to seeing it come into something. If that's, uh, that's I love, I love it. I love uh, films based on book. Like I, a lot of times, because I'm a publicist, but I also produce a lot of stuff. And I always tell people, you know, it's very cool to produce stuff after, you know, after it's coming out based on a book. Um, yeah. It also makes you look bigger. It sounds like <laughs> a thriller rather than a chop up. Yeah, no, it's not a chop up at all. In fact, uh, there's probably, I was actually thinking about it, maybe two scenes of any sort of real mayhem. <laughs> um, but the, the the review I get the most, and it's particularly from people who have children, because um, this story is about me and my family and my friends in this horrible situation and people I care about uh, suffer. And so as I'm writing it, I'm just, I don't want to imagine these things anymore, especially in the detail that I had to do. And my friends read it and said, oh my gosh, Bill, I mean, how do you even write about that? I had to stop. It's a really short book, but he said, I had to stop because I was so kind What's of overwhelmed with emotion. What's his, by his hand. By what his hand. hand. You know, our audiences don't know what we're talking about sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> hold up, William, hold yeah. that steady up to the camera. Sure. It's hold on, it, uh, it's on it Amazon up. and it's on all the different platforms. I understand. Interesting title. Yeah. It's, and, when you, and you'll see on the cover there, there's like sort of a bloody hand. Bloody I'll hand. only tell you that the reason he's doing that, it's the letter R. The letter what? R. The letter R. And um, what happened? I and what it's based on. I have arthritis really bad in my hands, my neck, and all these places. And I woke up one morning, and my hand was kind of gnarled like this. And I looked at it, and I recognized that's an R in uh, in American Sign Language. And, and and the dream that I had starts with that, and it starts to move all by itself. And a friend of mine that is at church, and he's look, he's just you know, put your hand up. I, I don't understand what you're trying to say. I said, what, what are you talking about? He's like, no, you got to lift your elbow because I mean, and, and you shouldn't be spelling it. There's a gesture. What are you talking about? And he, I'm spelling. He goes, yeah, you're not doing it real well, but <laughs> you're doing it. Like, I'm not doing that. And so that's where the book takes off and it gets freakier. It gets scarier. It gets terribly, terribly sad uh, in a couple of places. Not your typical slasher. And my favorite thing about it that people tell me is it's original. 
It's not based on anything. It's not a rehash. It's not a reboot. It's not. And that's, to me, that's the, the mark of my. Well, it has that's, no be better, that's a no better review than to say it's at least original. Yeah. So uh, that's terrific. So it has nothing to do with the movie, The Hand. With, no, uh, no, no. With Andrea King and Peter Lorre. Or, or, or this hand, the Freddy Krueger hand as well. I got his. Okay. It's, but it's a lot of hands in my life. So I have, have hand in I want to brag a little bit for you first so everybody kind of knows who you are. So you guys, these are the films that, that William R. Perry has worked on. Uh, first of all, the TV show Star Trek The Next Generation, which is kind of cool since our last guest you know, with Star Trek. And I want to say too, like, like, you know, we had Lee Waddell on last week and I read on your website, which is William Perry stunts.com. You know how you guys are really good friends. He was a, a great guest and he, he's phenomenal. Um, so, so we have a nightmare on Elm street, three dream warriors, the lost boys, the monster squad, return of the living dead Two, tape heads license to drive a nightmare on Elm street Four, Elvira, mistress of the dark predator Two. don't tell mom, the babysitter's dead. One of my all time favorite movies, Freddy's dead. The final night bear, the people under the stairs, Hook, Poison Ivy, and Newsies, and a Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, which I think I already mentioned. But um, so uh, my first, my first thing I want to like talk about. So I, I, so I'm a big horror movie fan, obviously, um, and I have all the action figures and everything that you could want. But my <laughs> favorite of all the Nightmare on Elm Street is Nightmare on Elm Street Three: Dream Warriors. I'm really good friends with uh, Jennifer Rubin, and she's been on the show a bunch of times, and we go to like red carpet events with her. And um, so I want to know something from Nightmare on Elm Street 3 just because that's like my favorite out of all of them. And, and to, to give you a – some, so Ron doesn't really like horror movies, but we had uh, Wiss. Amanda, Amanda. We, had a, we had Amanda Wiss on our show years ago, and he was we were talking about horror movies, and he didn't know which one it was. And he was like, as long as you're not the girl – who the, the blades come up and take through the bed and kill her, and she starts laughing. She's like, yeah, that's me. And he had no idea. Um, but Well, I can tell you my favorite very blue story of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Okay. So we're doing, we're doing the movie, and there's a scene where Freddy is this massive snake. And he's yes. this big, you know, and, he, and he's chomping up uh, uh, Patricia Arquette. Well, they film it backwards so that um, basically they can put her inside and then they kind of chomp backward, then they sh you know show it in reverse. So we're looking at this and kind of you know, all watching this and there a giggle starts to make its way around the set. And it's getting louder and it's getting louder because the joke is making its way from the lighting guys to the, everybody around. And finally, the director, uh, Chuck Russell goes, all right, what is so fucking funny? And the place goes quiet and he says, and and the big Freddy head looks like a penis, just just like a penis. And it's she. Somebody says, yeah, you know, I don't know where it came from. Nobody wanted to admit to it. He says, Well, that's the first time I ever saw a penis eat a girl to get into a movie, <laughs> <laughs> which is so much fun. And, oh, and the place breaks up. And of course, now we're a bunch of seventh grade kids. And he's saying, <laughs> All right, that's it. No more laughter. And of course, you know, now you can't stop. And so he says, And somebody go get some funk to put on the damn thing so it doesn't look so much like a dick. And that was it. We couldn't stop. He goes, if you guys can't stop laughing, I want you to go outside. And okay, okay. And so we'd go outside. And, and every time we'd step back in, we'd see that stupid thing. And we'd start laughing again. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. But yeah. think of it as being bright pink and veiny. <laughs> it was just, I don't know who, who could have created that and not seen what they had done. But, I uh, think that's hilarious. I, I love the movie, and I, uh, I so maybe I, it was intentional. Could be, you know. I mean, there is a, you know, horror always has kind of a, you know, erotic kind of yeah. element to it, and and I also worked with uh, uh, Wes Craven for a while too. I was his web developer, and I did uh, three different shows with him, and you know, he was uh, he was very uh, analytical about these films and he'd say you know the reason the uh, you know you get the red and green stripes is because you can see it from far away you know it's freddy even without having even if he's you know kind of shape-shifted and he was very analytical so if somebody made that into a penis well somebody had an idea that uh there was a little more eroticism <laughs> necessary in the nightmare on elm street franchise so you guys too you can follow william perry on instagram his his uh Instagram is Webs Craven, so R W E B S C R A V E N. Wes Craven, such an icon. Yeah, um, I read. I read. I read all the stuff on your website this morning because I knew you were coming on. So actually, you guys should go to WilliamPerryStunts.com and read some of the stuff about uh, the way you got to work with Wes Craven because that was super cool. So you did three Freddy Krueger movies, but you actually. Yeah. 
in some of them you actually do, are Freddy Krueger, right? No, no, no. Um, I'm always his victim. Oh, you're always <laughs> because, the victim. Okay. Yeah, the reason that I, that I got so much of the work that you were talking about is I'm a little guy. I'm like five foot six, weighed about 120 pounds at the time, arms like a nine-year-old girl. And so they needed uh, stunt guys because the, the Twilight Zone um, accident had happened back then. Yes. And so they said, you know, no more kids on set if they don't have to be. And so uh, I had these little skinny arms and this uh, stunt coordinator said to me, I've got this kid and he looks just like you. Um, and most of the stunt guys had, you know, real big thick arms because they were gymnasts originally. Um, and so they, you know, they were, you know, really just broad shouldered and, but they were short and they said, no, no, you can, you can really double kids. And uh, that really works. And so uh, it wasn't really my goal at the time. I wanted to be more of an actor, but my agents like you're too damn short, you know, and I said, yeah, what am I like quarter inch shorter than Tom Cruise? Um, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, okay. And so when this guy offered me a stunt job, I was like, well, we'll give it, we'll do one. And then he's like, no, no, gosh, there's nobody. Well, or very few people, your height and weight in the industry. And you could do a lot of shows. And so I did newsies and, you know, a lot of shows where they were kids. I did the wonder years. I mean, there's not a lot of stunts on the wonder years and there's not a lot of stunts on star Trek, but because uh, my the kid that I was doubling, Will Wheaton, who's now nine foot tall, um, stay away from milk. You could have yeah. had me. <laughs> um, but it was a, uh, you know, there was just a lot of work to do, and there wasn't so much competition. Uh, Lee, who's been my friend since we were little kids, uh, he's five foot 11, 180 pounds, just like every other stunt guy in town. And so he's competing against 200 people. I'm competing against three, maybe four. And so uh, there was a lot of work. We were slashing up teenagers, you know, left and right in every movie made in 1980 through 90. And so there was just a lot of work and it was really fun. You know, if you tell somebody you're an actor, they go, really, what restaurant? If you tell, yeah. them, you're <laughs> <laughs> if you tell them, if you tell the girl you're a stuntman, you can just hear their, you know, panties fall to the ground and in a wet splash and you go, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's me. Yes, I'm terribly studly. We're actually friends with like a lot of people who are always the creature, like Douglas Tate's a friend of ours you might know, yeah, Doug yeah. Jones. You know, we're doing a movie with Joe, Doug Jones getting ready to, to start soon. And um, uh, so let's talk about The Lost. So The Lost Boys is my one of my top five films of all time. Uh, I was too. very, very good friends with Brooke McCarter and Corey Haim. Um, Jamison Newlander has been on the show and he's actually coming on again in like two weeks. Um, so, so, so how was working on the lost boys? Cause really that's like my oh. favorite movie that and pretty woman, like my two favorite woman movies. Yeah, uh, Corey Haim was the kid that I doubled, uh, uh, probably, uh, more in lost boys and in uh, license to drive. License to drive yeah. And, uh, and, you know, just really nice kid, very sweet, very, uh, not affected by his fame the way a lot of kids I would run into would be pretty down to earth. He was having the best time. I mean, we were all having the best time. Somebody asked me the other day, if you had to watch one of your movies over and over, it's like Lost Boys. Well, you had that in the in the chamber, didn't you? <laughs> it's like, it's one of my favorite films just anyway. And it was cool. And it was, you know, everybody was good looking and the vampires were sexy and the, the, the music was great. And uh, the actors were great. I mean, Diane Weist, you got all these just amazing Diane. people you know, so many good people in the show. And it was just a great script, uh, a great shoot. It was fun. It was funny. And you just knew you were making a really cool movie, you know, I, and pretty much you don't always know that. Sometimes you look at this and go, Ugh. you know, you see him walking by with, you know, two, you know, pictures of blood and you're like, well, I guess that Academy Award's not going to be this yeah. year, you know? <laughs> so, that, you know, you, you this one, you like that. You know, Kiefer Sutherland was awesome. All the others, you know, just too good. Just too Billy good. Worth, we see at a lot of events in L.A. Do you live in L.A.? I do live in L.A., yeah. Okay, you live in L.A. So like, I, more, a little towards Ventura, but, uh, you know, up in the uh, in the area. I, like, love it, though. I think it's fantastic. So I took a, a video off of your YouTube channel. It's it's uh, it's titled William R. Perry Stuntman. It's not very long. I thought we would play it for everybody. So hang on just so people can see some of the stuff. Uh, that you've done. How about you introduce it, Juan, then play the one that says William R. Perry Stuntman, and then we'll be right back. Now, keep, set your expectations very low, people. I was doubling <laughs> kids. Let's keep it down here. Keep it maybe even below screen. Fire away. <laughs>
It occurs. So I, was, I missed some really good stuff. I didn't put the first stunt from when I come out the bus window. Got to go back and fix. That. Actually, though, what's the uh, and you know you need to put the you need to put the um, when you bust out. So we're, I'm really really good friends with Jan Birch and his wife and Sean Whalen. Um, and so you guys, he was also in the People Under the Stairs, and uh, you're the guy who breaks out, right? Yeah, yeah. there you go. You're the one who breaks out, like yeah, breaks out. Of I'm doing a show with those guys in uh, September in uh, Maryland, actually, with Sean and and uh, Jan and uh, I'm yeah. So looking forward to it. I haven't seen him since. And oh, I um, love that movie. It's you want to sit down movie. with a you know, sit down with mom and have a meal. Yeah. Well, Jan, Jan is a crazy if you know guy. the movie, you know why that's yes, true. I know he doesn't, but yes, Jan he is doesn't. great. Jan's a great guy. We so love Jan. How was how was working with Macaulay Culkin? Because when you worked with him, I mean he was probably like he was like the biggest, well, he's probably the biggest child star ever anyway, but he was like the biggest star ever, you know, in the well, second. Yeah, he, you know, he was about four foot six. That's pretty big. No, uh he you know, at that time, um, it was interesting. His his parents were around, and you know, of course, there's all sorts of, um, you know, books written and things written about his parents. And he just seemed like uh, he was having fun. But it's difficult for any kid, and I, I, I experienced this a lot with kids because of, of my work with them. Is that they're they're put into a adult place. You know, um, adult conversation, not meaning like uh, racy, but, you know, they're they're expected to live in an adult world. And not a lot of kids can do that. You know, you have to be very mature, very young because people are working. You know, it's twenty five thousand dollars an hour to make a movie and there's no goofing off, kid. You know, so I really kind of felt sorry for him because he was so, you know, so young. And this, you know, whole film is basically, you know, hanging on him and Joe Pesci. And, you know, and so uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure. And you have to be, you know, you get thrust into this adult world where your, you know, conversations aren't very childlike. And, uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, when I worked with him, I was sort of very, uh, uh, I, I just felt like, you know, I'm, I'm really good with kids. I got a couple of kids myself and I really just thought, gosh, why don't we just go take them out and just go skateboarding or something? Give them some, a chance to do something fun for a little bit, you know, uh, let him be a kid for a little bit. And uh, it didn't seem like he got much chance. And he was, you know, he worked so much. He was just doing one film after the next, after the next. And so I, you know, when I, when people will talk about he or, you know, some other, you know, child star being kind of odd, it's like, yeah. You don't know what they've, you know, you don't know the the youth that they've had. You know, it sounds great. You know, uh, they're making a hundred thousand dollars a week or whatever, but they're not spending that money. They don't even understand what it is. You know, I think it's a lot of work. I think it's. I mean, one thing I have to say because I follow Macaulay Culkin and all my social media. You know, and maybe he had some difficult years and everything, but he's really cleaned up well. He's got a wife. He's got a baby. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, he's doing really, really well. And I would only wish, you know, the best. I mean, he kept everybody entertained and there's really. Yeah. Seems, by example, I can't even think of a star that's bigger, you know, was bigger than Macaulay. Yeah. Hawk. Oh yeah. And and the movies are fun. You know, I mean, they, they, they show those, uh, you know, they're, they're holiday movies. So they show them over and over and over. And, uh, you know, I watch them and, you know, I see myself, you know, flop on it. I, as I watched the clip uh, on the uh, screen there, I was recognizing how much my spine hurts uh, doing the fall. <laughs> <laughs> we did that fall onto a uh, an actual, you know, uh, marble. Yeah, marble floor. Yeah, yeah, marble it, looked floor. Like on a, it looked like it was how on a real floor. How many times? Yeah, and uh, many not times? a lot of padding, you know. Uh, so yeah, every time I watch it, I go, "Oh my god, that looked like that hurt." Oh yes, it did. Again. Yeah. How, how many times did they shoot that scene? Just that scene was just twice. Um, uh, one of the other one that's similar to it is uh, we did something for Nightmare Six, where uh, the kid falls out a window and he lands on the ground. And the idea was the kid falls out the window and he falls from an upper floor window and he smacks to the ground. And then the the actual actor would stand up and go into camera and they would run to Freddie's house. Well, the the steady cam guy was kind of struggling to get the shot just the way they wanted. It wasn't my fault, but we did it eight times, and there was no pads. Oh. Seven foot ladder onto concrete, no. um, uh, and there was it was in the middle of the night, and it was about twenty five degrees that night. Never gets that cold hardly ever in L.A., but it was super super cold that night. I'm in bare feet, a t shirt, and skinny jeans, no. and I just remember looking at the stunt coordinator, and he's like, he turns to the director and says, "We can't just keep doing this," and he's like, "Well, how many more has he got?" And he said, "I'll tell you if he's got another one after the next one," and he says, "And from now on, they're five hundred bucks a piece." I was like, 
think. That's what they have. And, yeah, but I think we did it eight times. And I came home. I was a bruised, greenish, black mall. You know, just everything was so uh, just completely smashed. And I remember my uh, wife at the time, she turned to me and she says, you know, that's that's wrong, honey. They can't do this to you. I said, I made $8,000 tonight. She goes, we're getting a new couch. <laughs> 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 like, well, that, that, let me get your bag of ice. You go lay down on that old scrangly couch we got. We'll be replacing that shortly. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you recognize after a while, really, you know, it is the job. You know, if, if you were a football player and you came home with some, you know, bumps and bruises, you'd go, well, dude. Course, I was really every you know? time you have to do it is 500 bucks more. Yeah. I yeah. was going to say that. Yeah, plus your uh, plus you get your daily rate, which at the time was about a thousand bucks a day, and then if you go overtime, your overtime is based on how much you made for the day plus all the stunt adjustments. So you know you could be you know you could max out. I think at the time it was three hundred fifty dollars an hour. So if somebody says, "Oh, we're going long," you know nobody was groaning. You know, yes, everybody. I was friends with Burt Reynolds, and we talked a lot, and I, I know about his career. And I said to him, oh, "Do you miss doing stunts?" He said, no, I missed the money. He said, because when I did them, I was broke. And I, <laughs> he said, and I deliberately kept not doing it correctly. So they would say, another shot, another five, another shot, another five. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I ever purposefully did, but I, I would say that there were times when it, when it didn't go the way it was supposed to. Um, I was just glad it wasn't my fault. Um, and I, Or if it was my fault, I'm glad nobody said anything. Um, but yeah, when you get to do like we did a stunt where I had to go through a window of a bus as it's rolling down the street and I land on a follow vehicle and I went through the window and pieces of glass just stuck in me like a pincushion. And uh, I remember pulling it out and my, in fact, Lee was on the set that day and he took some crazy glue and he, you know, kind of glued me back together. And he's like, you're going again, but you know, you got to get that, you got you to stop bleeding. I'm like, <laughs> sorry, am I getting it on the outfit? He's like, no, you're you're bleeding to death. That's probably the more important thing. I'm like, no, I can't get it on the wardrobe. You know, wardrobe. Oh no. You know, have you so, ever you know, really hurt like, yourself though? Have you ever really no. been hurt? Hurt? No, but he had you, know, the, 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 he you had saw it. actually the only um injury that I ever sustained in the Elvira Mistress of the Dark, we fall through the ceiling. Yes. And uh as we hit the ground, they took uh uh plywood and they would put it on top of Dixie cups. And so when everybody lands, all the cups would smash and the, it would be a much softer landing. You know, pretty inventive stuff, except if you don't weigh enough to break the cups. <laughs> so I land and I just I, I was you know trying to tuck so we could get it. And my own knees got me in the nose. Oh, wow. Oh, just clean me out. Like, I mean, I, I've been punched before. Not like that. And I remember just feeling everything moving. And I like feel excuse me. I think I have. Uh, um something in my eye and I am racing into the bathroom. Are we going again? No. Yay. You know, okay, well, I'll see you guys. You don't do that. <laughs> I didn't want to tell anybody that I, I got hurt. I was, yeah. a, I was at a party years ago in Hollywood, of course. And there was this lovely redheaded woman with beautiful fire red hair. And I had no idea who she was, it was Elvira. She wore a black okay. wig. I never knew that. I, 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 she looked vaguely familiar, but... You know, with the bangs yeah. and the yeah, hanging fire red hair. Oh, and, it's, and just the kindest, very nice lady, Elvira. Oh, it's yeah. just the nicest person ever. Really, really sweet. sweet. It's so funny. You know, the she she's not funny because they write her good lines. She's funny. Yeah, she's know. fabulous. It was a it was a gay party, and the, she loved the gay guys, and the gay guys loved her. She's a lesbian. Yeah, oh, that's my understanding. Yes. I thought so. <laughs> I, I actually I, know her because I went I to Disney. I was heterosexuals, I got to be honest with you. <laughs> no, I thought she was a lesbian. I, I was at sure. Scream Fest, and I was in really good with all of I used to be a celebrity clothing designer, and I would give everybody free clothes, and then they would come on the podcast and stuff. And so I went to dinner with her and Gary Busey and a bunch of people uh, when we were there. She's a very and, nice uh, girl. And you, you mm. also worked in a Gary Busey film because you did stunts in Predator 2, which we just had Robert Davi on the show like, I don't know, maybe a month ago yeah. for the second time. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually had a character in that very, very briefly. Uh, I, I'm a gang leader because I, you know, I look like gang. You know, you see yeah. this look and you go, yeah, right. yeah, yeah like, you're street. Right. he's street. Watch out for that guy. Cross the street. Coming. 
Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we did a scene, and uh, I didn't actually get to work with Gary in person. Uh, we were—I get to work with Bill Paxton, who's also one of my Great. very favorite people in the world, nicest person ever, God rest his soul. And uh, it, that was just my my first time on camera. You know, I, I go to the movie theater; I'm 80 feet across. There is a thrill there that you just cannot know any other way. I remember seeing it, it was everything I dreamt about from the time I was a little kid. I wanted to be in movies so bad, and there I am up there 80 feet across for, you know, 30 seconds, my 30 seconds of fame. And but that's nothing more fun than that. Too good. I, I won't watch a movie. I'm in. Yeah, he doesn't like to watch himself. Never watch myself. Really? Never watch himself He'll go to the red carpet, but then he won't pay attention when he comes on the screen, really. Yes. You know, to me, you know, now, I mean, there's some movies I've done, who will remain nameless, that <laughs> I was not a big fan of. Um, but, you know, well, I kind of look at him and go, well, it was a great time. Well, you know. Let me explain it this way. When you reach 83 years old, are you going I to hope be I do. happy? You will. Are you going to be happy about watching yourself on the screen? I don't think so. I asked Jane Russell, Jane, now that you're 80 at that time, five, how does it feel that you're not what you were once? And she looked at me. She said, how the hell do you think I feel, Ron? <laughs> it is a pretty uh, obvious question. I won't say it's a stupid question. Well, but, me you know, seeing myself on screen, I say, that's not what I look like in person. Well, I, I see, you know, I see some old pictures of myself back from back in the day. And I was a good looking kid. You and I remember I went, I went to an agent and he says, Bill, I think we got some great work to do together. And I said, great. And we stand up and he goes, Jesus Christ, how short are you? <laughs> I'm I'm five six. And he goes, You don't look short in your headshot. <laughs> Can you? And I said, Well, you know, my stats are on the on the resume, you know. Right. And he goes, Well, I can't work with you. You're too short. He says, You're really good looking, though. It's too bad. Thanks for coming in. Bye. And I remember being fairly crushed by that, you know. But uh, at the time, you know, you, when you're you just bounce back, you know, or you either quit or you bounce back. And I, uh, when the stunt yeah, thing happened, I was like, this is fine. This is good. You know, this is, yeah. I still get to be in movies. I'm happy. Well, I like, love it. I think, I think you guys have such cool jobs. I could never do it. Um, when you did, don't tell mom the, so Keith Coogan and Dan, Daniel Harris is a friend of mine and Keith Coogan's been on the show. Like how, so I was always one of my favorite movies growing up. Cause for about 15 years, I was a clothing designer. And uh, that's actually how I got all the, that's how I started the show is I would go to conventions, give the, the stars clothes and become friends with them. And then they would come on the show. Um, and that's how I built this show at the very beginning. So like we were only on the air for not even six months. And I had Malcolm McDowell, Lance Henriksen, Clyde Barker, like all these huge people, wow. you know, on the show. Um, but his ratings were only like maybe 5,000 viewers. No, they weren't. We had a million <laughs> Uh, and then I came on the show and it went to five million. Yeah, is that when it took off? When it was you? It's all about you. We, we did. We, we're right now. We're like the top hundred podcasts in like twelve countries. Or yeah, I love that. There's people seeing me. I don't even know. Yes, five, they won't five, know five million people. Five million. Nice. Yeah, Hi, everybody. Are watching you right now? No, not now, but in syndication. You know, well, yeah, in, in, over the course of time. You know, oh, that's awesome. I, how I, I, this is so much fun. How how was Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead though? It's, it's such a great movie. Everybody in it, you know, kind of like you actually became the movie somebody. Before I wanted to ask him about, I think I saw that movie and I liked it. Out of all the shit, that yeah, I was uh, I doubled Keith actually. You mentioned oh, Keith. Was, Coogan. Oh, did you really? It was a yeah. movie. Hang on, hang on, wait. I want to hear double Keith Coogan. Yeah, but you know, my my greatest memory of that it was uh, Christina Applegate. Fabulous. Um, she was, you know, she was quite the star at that time. And I just remember uh, I sat down to have lunch and uh, she came over and she sat with me and she just, you know, like, so how are you doing today? And I was like, uh, I'm not, supposed, cool? to, I'm not supposed to be talking to her. I don't think, you know, she's the star, you know, avert your gaze. Uh, and she wasn't that way at all. you know, and I I done, the day and that we did that, I, I had my, it was my last day. And she said, well, you'll be back tomorrow. And I said, no. And she goes, well, it's been such a pleasure to meet you. And, and just Isn't couldn't have been nicer. Cool? And I just remember thinking, most people that are carrying a film have a lot of pressure on them and they're not usually super chill. And Wait. she was, and of course, I, you know, she's gorgeous. And I, you know, I was like, she's fabulous. <laughs> she's fabulous. And we actually had her ex-husband, Jonathan Sheck, who's been on before, but we just had him on a couple of weeks ago. Um, what, what are you looking for? What was a the movie that he's in that I wanted to talk about? And now I can't find the friggin' movie. License to Drive. No, it pins. was something that from Return of the Living Dead. I, I think it was a remake of something from my day. 
Return of the Living Dead. Maybe that remake. I don't know if I did any remakes. That's funny because we have Tom Matthews coming on next week, and he was in Return of the Living Dead. Yes, he was, and, and one and two, and I, yeah. I was in two. Um, I was a zombie child, if you can imagine. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's the thing. Ever, you know, but you, if you ever get to be a stuntman, and I'm sure you will in your career, it's coming for you. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, you oh. want to be a zombie because zombies never die. So if you're a stuntman and a zombie. Hey, run me over with a truck, throw me off a building, electrocute me, do whatever you want. I'm coming back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So you get paid. No, I was in a movie where I was supposed to do a stunt and the the, the, the rat that was eating us was the size of a Volkswagen. It was an <laughs> enormous prop. So this is in New York. No, this is here. <laughs> oh, here. So that I, was witty though. The rat, the rat was supposed to grab me, throw me against the door, I fall down and the rat grabs my arm and pulls me across the room and my arm tears off. As they well, do. Well, now I'm, I'm about 80, I think, when we're shooting this. Maybe 79. No, 80. 80. And uh, somebody came running over and said, you can't do that. You have to have a, we, don't, we don't have a stunt person here, but you're too old to do that because you could be injured. So I agreed. So what yes. they said was they made me go down in the basement and the rat runs up with my arm and you identify it by the wristwatch. So I was spared being knocked around. To be quite frank, I didn't think I could do it. You know what? I'll tell you, when people ask me, they say, oh, I could be a stem man. I, I, I'm fearless. It's like, you know what? The, the, you know, the idea of being fearless is the worst thing you could have because that means you're not looking out for all the things that could possibly hurt you. <laughs> And uh, I, I would always, whenever an actor would say, well, I could do it, it's like, you could, but if you even get the tiniest little scratch on your face, we got to wait until that clears up or we can cover it with makeup or whatever. You know what? Let, let me do it. I'll make you look good. I promise. You know, and, uh, you know, because I did come away with bruises. I did come away with lumps on the head. I did come away with concussions and broken wrist, broken nose, you know, things like that. Um, if that was the actor, if that was the actual actor, then that means he stops filming and who knows if the whole production has to grind to a halt. So it's like, nah, just, you know, let the stunt guy do his thing. Uh, it's, it's it, somebody else gets a job, you know, you're putting somebody out of work if you do it all yourself. Are you still so, doing stunt work now? No, I, I gave up on stunt work, gosh, about 25 years ago. Wow, am I old. Um, when my kids were born, um, it wasn't so much about the getting knocked around as it was, it's a difficult job to keep, uh, to feed a family on. You know, the difference between a pizza and a stuntman is a pizza can feed a family of four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, at that time, it was like, you know what, at, at 35, it was about time anyway. Um, it's tough to get that kind of damage all the time. And I had gotten into uh, doing web development. And at that time, Wes Craven was looking for a website. And so I built his website. And then People Magazine said, oh my gosh, this is one of the best websites we've ever seen. And they talked about it in the magazine. And then I was in demand and it was easy to transition over to another uh, line of work because the money was really, really good. And it was really fun to do and it's <clears throat> really creative. So uh, that was a nice transition. That's Wes Craven was actually my first employer, uh, my first stunt job. And then he was my first web job. So I love I, it. Was Wes, it was, thank you very was, much. Was, For one minute. Was it hard getting insured? Um, no, the, it's all covered by uh, uh, pension and health and all that sort of stuff. Because, you know, you're on a set and I, I never really got hurt that much that I ever needed it. You know, I was young and invincible. Now, God, I'd love to have that coverage now. So everybody, uh, this is William R. Perry. Follow him at Webb's Craven. You can also go to WilliamPerryStunts.com. And where do they get your books? Uh, anywhere. Uh, uh, Amazon. Amazon, you guys. Yeah. Oh, you buy can't his, not get that. If you're book. His hand or out You're of gonna his accidentally mind. purchase my book. It's gonna happen. It can happen. It's so 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 prevalent. Absolutely. So we want to thank you for coming on the show because we're out of time. Congratulations. If you make it a movie, let us know. If you need somebody to help produce it, let me know. And then I we'll do. Talk later. <laughs> All thank right, guys. Thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you, William. Bye, bye, bye. Good show. Hey, chat room. Thanks, Have everybody. Fun. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great weekend. Bye. Yeah, we 
we in the mix? Yeah, we in the mix. It's another episode. Here we go. The Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. Interviewing the hottest, newest, and truest of today's celebrities. Make sure to subscribe so you can get notified weekly. Jimmy Star, he's the king of cool. Ron Russell, he's a gorgeous dude. Chat room is live and you would be a fool not to vibe with us at the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. So come watch it live on W4CY Radio. Miss some past episodes? Download on iTunes. The Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. It's the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. Oh,